last week we, we started this brand new sermon series called Believable, right? Uh, and today we're going to focus on the example of peace. Because when life gets hard, it is hard to believe that we'll find peace. Because when life is hard, it is hard to believe that God would come to earth and save mankind from their troubles. Many people ask the question, is it believable that the God of the universe would come down and save people? And today we're going to focus on the theme of peace. In Psalms chapter 4, verses 6 and 8 says this, Many people say, who will show us better times? Let your face smile on us, O Lord. You have given me great joy than those who have abundant harvest of grain and new wine. In peace I'll lay down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. The idea of peace is this concept that is very important for you and I. That says that God got our back even when difficult times approaches us. Throughout the season of Advent, we will be learning from the Old Testament characters. And today, uh, we, as we gather together, we're going to explore the life of a remarkable guy. His name is Daniel. And we will explore his life through the context of Advent, especially on the theme of peace. Daniel's life offers us an invaluable insight on how to find and pursue Peace in the midst of chaos. As we learned last week, Advent is a time of preparation, of reflection and anticipation where we focus on the coming of Jesus. Not the fact that Jesus already came on his first Advent, but that he will come again as his second Advent. In the midst of so much trouble, so much chaos, so much worry, so much war, so much anxiety, uncertainties, disappointment that we find in the world that we live today. If there is one thing you and I need is the word peace. What does the word mean, peace means to you? What does the word mean, peace means to you? Let me ask you one other question. What is troubling your soul lately? What is troubling your heart? What is troubling in your mind? What is the significance of the word peace? To you. Jesus came to give us peace, right? It's that, that's exactly what he tells us in John chapter 14, verses 27. This is what he said. I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and peace of heart. Don't you love these words from Jesus? He's saying this. Listen, you deserve a gift and I'm giving it to you. This is the gift I'm giving to you. Peace of mind and peace of heart. I don't know about you, but as I go through my life, all the chaos, all the anticipation, all the problems, all the troubles, all the anxiety. I don't know if you know this, but pastors have anxiety too and uncertainties, right? And I don't know if you know this, but I have frustration and disappointments in my life. If there is one thing I personally need is peace. And I, when I read these verses, I am comforted to know that Jesus gives me this gift. And this gift settles my heart and settles my mind. And this gift is called peace. And he says, and the peace I give is a gift that no one else can give. It's a gift. That the world cannot give. So don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. As we are entering this Christmas season, we, are, we meditate uh, on the birth of Jesus. And, and, uh, and hundreds of years before uh, the, the, the birth of Jesus happened, the prophet Isaiah was already preparing our hearts for the gift of God in Jesus. And before, before Jesus ever was born, Isaiah was already preparing everybody. And, and as we read the, uh, the Old Testament, we are being prepared for the gift that God would give humankind. And this is what Isaiah chapter 9, uh, 6 said over 700 years before Jesus was ever born. He said this, for, uh, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and, and the government will, will be on his shoulder. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Jesus is our gift of peace. The Prince of Peace. 
On the night of Jesus' birth, the angels proclaimed the good news to the shepherds, again emphasizing the peace that Christ would bring. Look what the angel says, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Peace, the gift of God to humankind. But I don't know about you. But I think we live in turbulent times. The times that we are living today is turbulent ones, but we are not the only ones who live in turbulent times. Daniel also lived in turbulent times. Just as we prepare for the coming of Christ during Advent, Daniel lived in a time that could be described as the advent of captivity. The Israelites were taken from their homeland, and this period was marked by uncertainty and turmoil and chaos and, and disappointment and frustrations. And this is what we read in Daniel chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. Now, there's a lot of crazy names over here, okay? I, it's impossible to pronounce them, so it has nothing to do with my English, all right? I, perf I speak perfect English. Don't blame my English for these ones right here, okay? So during the third year of the king, Jehoiakim, reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The word besieged there has this idea that it means overwhelmed, stunned, surrounded. And as I was preparing myself this morning, uh, reading these verses, when I read the word besieged, I, I, it really, it really, I don't know why, it really sank into my heart, into my mind. I, I don't know about you, but um, lately I have felt overwhelmed. I have felt stunned. I have felt that I have been surrounded by the different circumstances that I find myself in life. Have you ever found, have you found yourself in the last uh, weeks, months, or maybe even throughout this year, overwhelmed, stunned, and surrounded? That the kings that is surrounded us is much bigger than we can even uh, overcome. We can defeat the enemy that is coming over us. The enemy is so huge. You feel like, oh my goodness, I'm about to perish. There is nothing else. I am taken to captivity, and I'll never be taken away from here. The Lord gave him, Nebuchadnezzar, victory over the king of Joachim, of Judah, which puzzled me, and permitted him to take some of the secret, uh, the secret objects from the temple to, uh, of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylon and placed them in the treasure house of his God. See how the God there has a little g? Then the king ordered, uh, what job job? Much close to that. His chief, priest, his chief of staff to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah, royal family, and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as, a, as captives. And among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael, and Azariah. And they were four of the young men chosen off from the tribe of Judah. During this time, Daniel faced some numerous challenges and temptations in his life. Babylonian culture often crashed with Daniel's faith, with how Daniel was taught to, what Daniel was taught to believe, how he was taught to live life. But his unwavering commitment to God led him to a life of profound peace. Because our God is a God of peace. We start to lose peace when we compromise our relationship with God. But that was not an option for Daniel. When he was faced with temptation from the culture, when he was tempted with challenges from the world, he did not waver. He, he stayed uh, firm. He did, not, he did not allow the circumstances, the temptations to deviate him from the one through God. It was not an option for Daniel who faced who, for Daniel who faced many challenges in Babylon. Babylonian culture was really averse to, to, to Daniel's faith and, 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 pro, and provided several uh, of the temptations and the challenges. And let me bring some of those for you right now. Uh, dietary laws. 
from chapter 1, chapter 1, verses 8 to 16, you, you read about that. But when Daniel and his friends were brought to Babylon, they were given food and wine from the king's table, while, uh, which likely, uh, likely didn't conform to the Jewish dietary uh, law, so the Israelite dietary law. So, however, uh, they made, uh, those guys made a commitment to not defile themselves with the king's food. This is what we read in verses 8. Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Daniel wasn't ready to compromise. And, and when it comes to food, I don't know about you, but the word food has to do with sustenance, right? Has to do with livelihood. Has to do with you being able to do the things that you're supposed to because we, you well nourished, right? So it's like a provision thing. And, and Daniel did not compromise in the face of challenges that comes with provision to his life. It was only about provision, dietary thing, food, the sustain lives and maintain us alive. It was also about idol worship. On chapter 3, verses 1 to 30, he was challenged, uh, 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 attempted to worship a different God. And, and King Nebuchadnezzar created a golden statue and commanded everyone to worship it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the statue, even when threatened with death in the fire furnace. Wow, to have the serenity of mind and of heart... Um, to not bow down to a statue that the king has made and obligated everybody to do so. How many of us bow down to the idols of this world? That was not what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, or to, to, to Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at the serenity of these guys. Look, look, look at this. Verses 16 and through 18. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he does not, even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, the king of kings, that we will never serve your little gods or worship your little statue that you have set up. Wow. The peace of mind, the serenity in the heart to look the most powerful guy on planet Earth, humanity's sake, saying at the time, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, I mean, he was the guy, and to say, ah, buddy. We know who you are. We know a lot of the powers. But let me tell you what. There is a God. He got my back. And let me tell you this. If he throw, it, when you throw us there, if we get burned up, great. And if we doesn't, guess what? God saved us. How, how many of us, as soon as we are threatened to be thrown into the stove, we freak out? Not this guy. Peace. Peace. It wasn't only about idol worship, it wasn't about uh, providence, it was also about prayer. In, Gen in Daniel chapter 6, verses 6 to 13, we read the importance of prayer in the life of Daniel, right? A group of officials conspired against Daniel because he continued to pray to God despite King Darius' decree that no one should pray to any God or man other than the king himself. So this guy saw Daniel's faithfulness to the one true God as an opportunity to trap him. And this is why we read in verse 10. When Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room while it is uh, with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Peace, even when laws are written down that goes against biblical truth, peace, to continue to live within God's word. 
another temptation to, to, to fall into uh, what the world did in the life of Daniel. The, uh, the, another temptation, another challenge that came towards him was, uh, was on the astrology and the wise men. When the king Nebuchadnezzar had a troubling dream, he demanded that his wise men and the astrologers would interpret the dream. The wise men faced the temptation to rely on their own wisdom and, and magic arts to, de to decipher the dream. And then it was Daniel's turn. And Daniel, Daniel did not uh, 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 turn into any of these things. Neither did he turn to pride. But he, he turned into trusting in God. And he pointed the king to God himself. Look what Daniel did in verse 27 of chapter 2. Daniel replied, There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. In the future. Now, I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. In each of these instances, Daniel and his friends was faced with significant conflicts between their faith and the Babylonian culture. Not much different than us in the 21st century, 21st century who are faced very much with conflicts between our faith, God's word, and the cultural norms. They demonstrated their commitment to God's commands and principles, even when it meant standing against social pressures and facing several consequences, which were the fruit of the peace they had inside of them, especially in the life of Daniel. Here's where our worlds come, come, Daniel's world and our world comes together. We also in the 21st century, we are facing significant conflicts between our faith, in our relationships, with the world and the culture in which we live. We are consistently being challenged by, by the, the, with, uh, against, uh, and asked to live against Christian biblical norms. And what I have found is that unlike Daniel, most of us are losing our peace, are losing our cool when facing conflicts which are leading us to really bad roads. I am afraid that followers of Jesus does not have peace that leads to good roads, that we are losing our cool, that we are losing our faith when we are challenged, when we are challenged, when we face chaos, when we face uh, anxieties, uncertainty, disappointments in life. And the bad roads that is leading us is roads of violence of bullying, of oppression, of argument, of disputes, of division. I was just talking to a theologian, cousin of mine yesterday, and he said this statement, and I thought it was fitting to put it here for you today. His name is Flavio Justino Rosa, and this is what he said, violence is the escape of a mind that has no resource for creativity. I think we are becoming more destructive and more sensitive because we don't have peace. It doesn't matter what side of the theological spectrum you are, political aisle you sit in on, the people, people throw insults more quickly than ever before. Those who see things in another way aren't just uh, uh, different or even wrong. Uh, increasingly, they are being tagged with some not-so-cool titles like idiots and snowflakes and bigots and heretics and even worse. Yet, it seems like the people most likely to insult others are the first ones to be offended by even the smallest expression of opposition to what they believe. Because of a lack of peace in the world, we are becoming more legalistic and moralistic and less ethical, honorable, and right. We, we have embraced Hollywoods and government movements and political agendas as our new found sense of morality. 
Our new role models in society comes from corrupt sectors of societies, leading us to, lo- to lack of morals, but very much so moralistic, high-minded, and legalistic. I'm afraid that the lack of peace that comes from Christ himself, that gift of peace from Christ to us, are, 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 are making us... We are becoming, because of that lack, we are becoming more spiritual, more atheistic, atheistic at the same time. A miracle, a miracle. We are more spiritual and atheistic at the same time. It is a miracle. The two fastest rising religions in America today, and in the world really, is the, uh, is the, cultural, it is the culture of no religions, but it's spiritual. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. We are becoming a culture of, of the nor, normally, normally atheistic. And the generic spiritual. The other day I went to, to, to CVS. Uh, after I wrote the sermon, I, was, I went to a CVS, got a ibuprofen. And then you have the brand ibuprofen, and then you have the, the what? Generic. The generic. That's, that's all we have in the world today. The generic is spiritual. Sometimes the same person claims to be both. Non-religion and spiritual, non-spiritual but religious. I'm like, whoo. This spiritual vacuum may actually be at the heart of all the other contradictions we find in society. After all, if we can't make up our mind about uh, the ultimate questions of life, reality, and eternity, how can we find a place to stand anywhere for anything in life? But that's not true with Daniel and his friends. Daniel's uh, uh, unwavering trust and faith and willingness to resist the temptation of his time served as a powerful example to us of maintaining faith and finding peace in the face of cultural conflicts that we might run into. For Daniel, peace was not found in the absence of conflict and temptations. Peace is found in his unwavering faith and trust in God. And I am afraid that we in the 21st century is lacking faith in our, in our lives because we don't have an unwavering faith and trust in God. Living a peaceful life all depends on our ability to trust God. Regardless of the of the of, the, of our the, the, the circumstances and the situation that we are currently living in, mastering trust in God above all can be challenging. But when you trust in Him, you will succeed in obtaining the peace in life. That's exactly what Proverbs chapter three verses five and six. We all know chapter three and six. Uh, uh, chapter three verse six and five. Uh, uh, if you don't, here's I'm introducing to you. But it says this: Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all that you do. He will show you which path to, to which path to take. What this verse is saying is: this, Listen, when you start, when you master trusting in God. Peace will be reached in your life. Daniel's peace was not a fruit of who he was or what was going on around him or uh, the good, the bad, or uh, the ugly or the indifferent. That was not. It was fruit of his trust and unwavering faith in God's almighty hand who was for him. And that faith began with Daniel's life of prayer. He has this prayer of anticipation. Daniel had this prayer of anticipation. He prayed in anticipation of what God was going to do. I I love this about Daniel. And I think we need to learn from him to have this kind of prayer of anticipation. Daniel's life of peace began when, when, when he has this disposition to prayer of anticipation. He prepared his heart for the coming of God's guidance each day. Which should mirror to us this season of Advent. 
when we prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, not only in his second coming, but the coming of Christ to save his people from the circumstances that is destroying us right here and right now. Do you believe that God is for you at this moment in whatever you're going to through in your life? Does your prayer is a prayer of anticipation that God is coming for your rescue? Or is it a prayer of desperation? I think we need to change our attitude in prayer. Instead of praying in desperation, we need to pray in anticipation that God's going to come to rescue his people as he said he would. Look what Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 tells. We already read it, but I'll read it for you again. When Daniel learned that the law has been signed, that he was going to get a spanking from the little king, he went home and he knelt down before the king of kings and the lord of lords in his upstairs rooms with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day. Uh, he prayed three times a day just as he had done, had, done, had done before, giving thanks to God for the, deliver that, the deliverance that he would be provided for. Prayer of anticipation. But, but this faith not only began with the prayer of anticipation, but also in this dependence on God's promised arrival. He not only anticipate, uh, prayed and anticipating God to come, he already knew that God would come to his rescue. Uh, uh, da Daniel's life reminds us that true peace comes from the inner assurance of God's presence and guidance. And Daniel's dependence on God's promises is associated with his dependence on God's promise to his life. And for us, it's not different. Our dependence on God's promises is associated on the dependence of God's promise that had been fulfilled in us, to us, through Christ. That Christ would come and save us, his people. Daniel... His prayer, it was based on the promise of God. And look what chapter 6, verses 22 and 23 says. May God, my God send his angel to shut down the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. So I have been found innocent in his eyes and I have no wronged you. I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the, the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Daniel had a prayer of anticipation that God would come to his rescue. He believed in God's promises that God would come to rescue his people. And just like Daniel's faith sustained him in the lion's den, we are called to have faith that Christ's coming is, our, uh, is our, uh, to our rescue. It is our rescue from the challenges and the trials that we face in life. Jesus came not only to save you eternally, he came to rescue you from the troubles you're facing in life right here and right now. We are called to have faith that Christ's coming is a rescue from life's most challenging trials. Especially the challenges that we are facing in our relationships, in our workplace, on our society. I want to conclude this message with uh, these few last words. I think Christians are called to pursue. I don't think the Bible tells us that we are called to pursue peace in our lives. In a similar way as Daniel pursued in his. By adopting these principles and these practices that I think is going to be very fruitful for us through the season of Advent. Daniel trusted in God's sovereignty. And I think we need to. Like Daniel, we should acknowledge God's sovereignty over all circumstances of life. This trust can help, uh, help all of us find peace Peace in the knowledge that God is ultimately in control, even in challenging situations. I think we need to be more consistent in prayer. We, we must maintain a regular and fervent prayer life, which allows us to establish a strengthen and strengthen our connection with God himself. Prayer provides a source of comfort, of guidance, and relief in the midst of life's biggest challenges. 
I, I think like, uh, like, uh, like Daniel, we ought to pursue integrity and faithfulness. We should uphold our Christian values and principles even when we face with conflict with social norms. Maintaining integrity and faithfulness to God's commands and, teaching, uh, and teachings can bring us um, so much peace. Can, can bring ser serenity to your mind knowing that one is living in alignment with God will bring peace that will transcend all understanding. We ought to seek wisdom and discernment. Followers of Jesus must seek wisdom through the study of Scripture, guidance from trusted mentors, and discernment through the Holy Spirit can help us make wise decisions and find peaceful resolutions to complex problems we face in life. Finally, we have to hope in God's plan. I find that peace really uh, is attained in my life when I hope in God's plans. When I know that God has a divine plan that is in place in my life and in the world in which we live. Christians can place their hope in God's ultimate plan for the future, which includes the promises of redemption and restoration, the promise that he will transform your life and your situation right here and right now. This hope can provide peace knowing that God's ultimate purpose are trustworthy and just. I love these verses from Revelation chapter 21, 3 and 7. They bring me hope. And they give me peace. This is what Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 and 7 says. Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death. Or sorrow. There will be no home or crying. If you are in pain, that's going to go away forever. All these things will be gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write these things down. For what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am uh, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all whom are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. I will be their God and they will be my children. Peace comes. When followers of Jesus hope in the plans of God to restore all things. What does peace mean to you? What is trouble in your mind and what is trouble in your soul? I'll ask it again. Today in your context, Contact in your situation of your life, what is peace to you? But what is troubling in your mind? What is troubling your heart? What is troubling your soul? This Advent season, let us not only seek peace with ourselves, but also be ambassadors of peace, sharing the message of hope, love, and joy and peace that Christ brings. We followers of Jesus are called to pursue peace in a similar way that as Daniel did, by trusting God's sovereignty, by maintaining consistency in prayer, by upholding integrity and faithfulness, by seeking wisdom and discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit, by hoping in God's plan, divine plans for your life and for the world. These principles can guide every single one of us into a peace that only Christ can give while facing the many challenges and uncertainties in the 21st century. 
So as we reflect on Daniel's life, the context of Advent theme of peace, we are reminded that peace is not just the absence of chaos, but the presence of the one who promises peace. As we prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, let us imitate Daniel. Daniel's unwavering faith, prayerful anticipation, and trusting in God's promise of peace. In this Advent season, may we not only find peace, but share it with a, a world that needs the serenity that only comes from Jesus Christ.